In this video we look at transforming polynomial functions. So just a reminder that a polynomial function is a function that can be written like this here. Uh, it looks a little bit complicated at first. Just a reminder we have a variable. Oftentimes the variable is x. It doesn't have to be, but it often is. The other thing to note here is that the exponents are whole numbers and typically they would kind of decrease as you go from uh, left to right, but they certainly don't have to be. That's, that doesn't necessarily make the uh, the uh, function not a polynomial if they're not in the right order. But typically you would see these organized uh, with the exponents going from highest to lowest. Uh, and those exponents would have to be whole numbers. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about some terminology. Just a reminder that the degree of the polynomial is the uh, highest exponent that is on the variable. So we use this function down here as an example. So here is the variable with the highest exponent, and that exponent is a 2. So we say that this polynomial has degree 2, or is a second degree polynomial. We can also talk about it having order 2, different sort of terminology for the same sort of thing. And all of these values down here, those numbers in front of the variables are called coefficients. Coefficients. This term out here is called a constant term. It's called a constant because it doesn't change. It doesn't matter what value the variable has. It's always the same. And you might be wondering, why does this kind of break the pattern? We have variables to exponents. Technically, we could write this as 1 times x to the 0. But we know that for most things, x to the 0 is equal to 1. Um, this coefficient, the one that's attached to the term with the um, highest exponent on the variable, is called the leading coefficient. And again, it's called that leading coefficient because typically we would write the polynomial from highest uh, degree term to lowest degree term. So that, as you can see, is the leading coefficient. It's the one at the front. It's the coefficient of the one that's highest. Now, again, the order doesn't necessarily matter here. This is just conventions. We typically write them from highest degree term to lowest degree. But if we swap the order around, uh, that would still be true. Let me finish writing this and I'll show you what I mean. So this is the leading coefficient. So for example, if I rewrote this polynomial, so it's the same polynomial just in a different order as negative 2x plus 3x squared plus 1, the leading coefficient is still this 3. It is the coefficient of the term with the highest degree. We should probably write that down. So it's the coefficient... of the term with the highest degree. All right, now that we've kind of reviewed some terminology and maybe added a little bit of new terminology, let's get into transforming some of these polynomial functions. You've seen lots of graphs of quadratic functions. You've done lots of transformations there. We're just going to kind of jump back and do a little bit of review. Let's start with um, a polynomial here, and I think I'll just write this out. We're going to start with a, uh, we'll start with a quadratic one because I know you're quite familiar with them. Uh, AX squared plus BX plus C. So again, it's a polynomial. It has a variable of X. Those X values have exponents that are whole numbers. There are some coefficients. I've just use letters for those coefficients. And what we're going to do is we're going to graph this, and, and there'll be a link for you to be able to access this uh, document that I'm about to show you. And we're looking for some of the characteristics of these polynomials. We, we want to know what is the end behavior of this quadratic function when the a value is greater than zero. You may be able to do that without graphing. I want to show you how to do it while you're graphing so you can get a sense of what's going on. I think what we'll do is we'll just kind of look at the function itself. You can see here's the function right here. Should maybe stick a an f at x at here at the beginning here and so there's our function and we've got these sliders that we can slide around and kind of see what's happening so I, I'm just gonna uh, well let's choose one and maybe grab a screenshot of this so that we can come back 
and uh, or sorry, not so we can come back, but so we can take it back to the work that we were doing and uh, find some of those characteristics. All right, so I'll just paste it over here for now. Let's stick it right over here, and then we can use this. So our a value on this function was equal to one. You can see it here. The a value is equal to one which is greater than zero. So the end behavior when A is greater than zero. When we talk end behavior, we're looking at what's happening out here. So as X gets really large in the negative direction, what's happening to the Y value? So the further I move out this way, the Y values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if I start here, they're negative. Y values down here, over here at zero, over here it's positive. And you can see that as I move, uh, t more towards the left, more towards negative infinity, the y values are getting infinitely larger. So let's write that down. So as, I don't know if I'll be able to fit all of this in here, but we'll try. So x, as x goes towards negative infinity, the y value is going towards positive infinity. So as we go towards negative infinity in the x direction, here's x and here's y, the y values are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now the other part of this question is to look at what happens when x gets infinitely large in the positive direction. So as we move from left to right, the x values are getting bigger. What do you notice about the y values? You should notice that they're getting larger and larger as well. So as x goes towards positive infinity, the y values are also going towards positive infinity. Um, so that's for a greater than zero. I think because or since we have this slide here with a greater than zero, why don't we fill in some of these other a greater than zero uh, characteristics and go from there. So it, does it have a maximum or a minimum value? You can see that the a value was greater than zero. This function has a minimum value. Again, you may have known that from before. Let's talk about the domain of this function. So remember the domain is a list of all possible x values this function can have. So I can kind of imagine myself just kind of moving along the x-axis and trying to see what are, are there any x values that don't show up? Well, if I'm way over here, the x value is here, corresponds to a y value here. x value here, y value, x, y, and so on. So it looks like the domain here is just going to be that x is an element of the real numbers. And again, that's for a greater than zero. What about the range? Well, the range, notice here that the range uh, is all possible y values. I can have any value greater than whatever this minimum is. So depending on where you've left your a, b, and c values, that's going to change the range. But we would say that y is an element of the reals and such that y has to be greater than or equal to whatever this minimum value is. And I'll just put minimum in here because then we can use this every time. And there's no sense in me just trying to estimate that value on the graph because we're trying to generalize here. All right, let's move on now and let's look at what happens when a is less than zero. So we'll just flip back to that graph. We will make a less than zero. There we go. Maybe we'll just slide this around a little bit. So when a is less than zero, there we are. Again, let me grab a screenshot of that so we can use it to fill in our table. So we don't need this one anymore. So the end behavior, let's go back to end behavior. We'll do this in a different color. The end behavior, what's happening way out here. As x, as x gets large in the negative direction, so as x approaches negative infinity, what's happening to the y values? The y values are getting uh, more and more negative. So we say that y is approaching negative infinity. And then let's look on the other side, what's happening as x goes towards positive infinity? So as x goes towards positive infinity, the y values are just becoming more and more negative. So the y values 
are also going towards negative infinity, just like they were on the other side. All right, moving right along here. Is it a max or a min? There's a maximum happens right there. Let's call that a max. The domain, again, x can be any value. So we just say that x is an element of the reals. And the range, the range is all possible values of y that this function takes on. And in this case, that's anything below the minimum. So we say that y is an element of the reals such that y is less than or equal to whatever that maximum value is. You'll never have a y value greater than that maximum, so that's where we can kind of leave that. All right, and this question here seems a little bit tricky. It says the minimum num number of x-intercepts, and you might look at this and say, well, obviously there's, there are two x-intercepts. There's one here and there's one here. You might want to think about, could we shift this graph to get any more x-intercepts? And it doesn't matter how we shift this graph. If I shift it uh, up, I, I'm still going to have two. You know, if we shift the graph up to so that the x-axis will is down here, we'll still have two. So it turns out that the maximum number of x-intercepts is two, but the minimum is a little bit different. Let's flip back to the graph to have a look at what that looks like. So can we shift this graph so that we have a, a different number? So you can see that the a value. Well, actually, that's an interesting one, right? That has that has no x-intercepts. Here's a, a graph with two. I can't get any more than two x-intercepts. I can probably get zero. That we've seen that one. There we go. That one where the graph just touches the x-axis. So there's one. So I can have zero x-intercepts. I can have one. And sorry, I can have one. I can have two or I can have zero. I shift up that graph high enough, I could have zero x-intercepts. So we know two is the maximum, and now we know that zero would be the minimum number of x-intercepts. So there are some characteristics of the graph based on uh, the equation of the function, sliding things around and being able to find different uh, values. What you're going to do is to try some different functions. So try a linear function, uh, we've done the quadratic, you do a cubic and a quartic. And again, just slide those A, B, C, D values around until you can answer all of these questions uh, and go from there.